Um, thank you everyone for joining us. My name is Ryan Semke. I am with Move United, formerly Disabled Sports USA, the insurance program manager over here. Uh, we're very excited to have you joining us today for a follow-up to our virtual leadership conference from May for the um, risk management mitigation, uh, managing risk beyond compliance session presented by our insurance broker, Willis Towers Watson. Um, to, through the GoTo webinars functionality, the um, participant to participant chat features are not are disabled and are um, you, everyone is in listen only mode and is muted throughout the entire presentation. If you we are more than happy to field and answer questions, we ask that you submit those questions through the question box and we'll get to those throughout the presentation and um, answer them towards the end. If we do run out of time, this presentation is scheduled for 45 minutes. We may run over a little bit with Q&A, but if we're unable to answer your questions here, we'll definitely be uh, following up uh, with you directly afterwards. Um, for those of you who uh, need to utilize closed captioning functions, um, we're unable to do that during this session right now, but please check the recording that will be posted later this afternoon on YouTube where uh, closed captioning will be available. And that also goes to remind everyone that this session is being recorded um, and will be made available to all in attendance as well as posted on the Leadership Conference webpage. So with that, I'll go ahead and turn it over to James Marciello with Willis Towers Watson. Thank you, Ryan, and thank you at Move United. We appreciate uh, you know the partnership that we have with you. We, we, we very much value this. and. Uh, and we value the uh, opportunity to come back to you. For those that were uh, on the line on our original call, thank you for your patience and thank you again for uh, allowing us this opportunity. Um, James, James Marciello here. Um, I am what, what we call a client advocate. Uh, it is a fancy term for the uh, conduit that Move United uses in and out of Willis for our, uh, our various resources. And that's uh, from loss control and claims, which we'll discuss today. Uh, as well as the placement of the overall insurance program. Uh, so today's program, today's discussion will be uh, managing risk beyond compliance. Uh, we will be starting off with loss control. Uh, Charles will uh, will start, and Jim Jordan will take over for the claim side. From there, we'll have we'll have questions. So again, we thank you all for the opportunity today. With that said, Charles, uh, a quick introduction would be fantastic, and let's uh, let's 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 get this going. Okay, thanks, James, and um, good afternoon or morning, depending on where you're calling in from. We really appreciate taking time out of your day. Uh, we do want to remain in that time contract of the 45 minutes and allow uh, ample time for questions. So I'll be moving through the presentation quite rapidly, um, and then as we get started and we get into, you'll hear from myself. Um, again, Charles Brandt, I'm calling you from Baltimore, Maryland. However, I have national responsibility throughout the United States, and I work directly with uh, Mr. Jim Jordan, who's on the line with us as well. He is our claims practice leader, and you're going to hear from him uh, just directly after my segment of the presentation. So, Ryan, if we can get going, we'll go to the objectives. Next slide, please. So here's how we're going to accomplish our objectives today. We're going to actually, as the title in, 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 uh, said, states, uh, we're going to talk about beyond compliance. Um, and how do we do that? We're going to we're going to take a look at how we actually recognize, evaluate, and control risk. And uh, as it says in the next bullet point, there, everything we do and everything you do as a as a chapter of Move United uh, comes with a certain degree of risk. And we're going to talk about how people make decisions, the psychological aspects of making decisions um, during discretionary time and non-discretionary time. And if you've never heard this term PRDM, we're gonna introduce that to you, uh, which ties directly in how to, uh, how people and how our brains work when we, when we come across um, a, a situation that involves risk. We're gonna look at some trends in safety management, introduce what we call ERM, Enterprise Risk Management. Maybe you've heard that term before. We're gonna break that down a bit. Hopefully as a result of this, Short session this afternoon, this morning, again, wherever you are, reinvigorate your safety culture as an organization. We're gonna talk about that at the local level, and we're gonna talk about that at the national level as well. And hopefully, uh, we'll help you recognize safety and the ERM process as a value proposition, not just as a standalone component, as in a safety element that works within your organization. And then Jim's gonna come in to discuss some of the best practices for incident investigation. 
So Ryan, let's get kicked off. So there are a lot of safety rules and regulations that are out there. As a safety and health professional, I deal with them almost on a daily basis. Some of these you may recognize, some of them you may not. Um, but as a result of all of these safety rules and regulations that are out there, you see the picture of the binder there in the upper left-hand corner. Many organizations, believe it or not, have a plethora of information available to them. And sometimes it's overkill to the point where it's very difficult to communicate this information or the expectations from, let's say, your chapter and the volunteers and the folks that work with you every day. Um, so there's plenty out there to, uh, to reference. Uh, it's how do you absorb all this information? How do you take it in and make the right decisions to establish a, a sound risk management process? Next slide. So let's talk about what gets us in trouble. Uh, this is um, on the private sector, whether it be, um, it, it could even be from a government perspective as well, but most organizations, including nonprofits, this is, these are the top three things that usually get us in trouble. You've heard that term liability, it's used loosely many times. Negligence is thrown out there. We're really, when we talk about liability and negligence, uh, you're talking about a, a, a four-legged chair. There has to be these four elements. There's the duty owed. There's a breach of that duty. There has to be some type of foreseeability where we, we understood that there was potential for an event to occur. And there has to be a causal relationship to that loss, which is usually serious injury, dismemberment, serious incidents, or even, unfortunately, death sometimes. So there has to be a causal, a causal relationship to what attorneys call damages. Also reputational risk, whether it's direct, whether it's through association, affiliation, where one of your members might act in an inappropriate way. Um, sexual assault is one of those that's quite, quite common, unfortunately, or some type of scandalous activity. Also what your chapter prints and what you say or may say in public against others. There's also the financial risk involved in what we do. Misappropriation of funds, the fraud, the theft, accounting errors, whether they be an intentional or unintentional, could be tax evasion, misrepresentation, the fundraising efforts and how, how you go about that, and lack of proper disclosure. These are the things that get organizations in trouble. All of them come with some type of risk and we're gonna talk about how we manage those risks. Next slide, please. So take a look at this little cartoon here. All of these compliance rules and regulations, they're such a bother. I never thought we actually had to read our policies and procedures. And believe it or not, many organizations are in this boat. They're in this camp. As we alluded to in the second slide, a lot of information out there, a lot of compliance rules and regulations, and they do tend to be a bother, a hassle. You're out trying to accomplish your objectives uh, through adaptive sports and your programs, but the necessary evil are compliance rules and regulations. But many times we don't even take the time to communicate our rules, our policies, our procedures, or if we do communicate them, they're not understand, understood correctly or they're not enacted or implemented properly. Next slide, please. So communication is a big part of this. This is probably the number one breakdown that we see in managing risk, lack of communication. Because as we look at uh, accident investigations, Jim's gonna talk about, we hear, oh, I didn't know that. I wasn't aware of that. I didn't even consider that. Um, all of these rules, regulations, standards, policies, procedures, laws, guidelines, recommendations, and MOUs that are out there that might go into your policies and procedures and the way you, the way you operate. But unfortunately, Ignorance is not an excuse, and the attorneys are certainly going to hold you accountable uh, should you get involved in an incident involves what we call a significant emotional event uh, where there are damages, as we, stop, we, we spoke to, or even negligence. Look at this sign. I think this, this says a lot. I use this in a lot of presentation. Caution, the sign has sharp edges. Do not touch the edges of the sign. Well, that's maybe good information to know, but if I'm just driving or walking casually by the sign, that's not really important to me. But look there in the fine print, and this is what we often overlook. Also, the bridge is out ahead. So when you do communicate these policies, rules, regulations, make them clear and concise. Uh, make sure there's 
a level of understanding uh, within that communication, because this is the Achilles heel of managing risk many times. Next slide. There we go. So here in this slide, you see one of the pictures I want to bring your attention to is President Nixon in 1970 signing the OSHA Act into law. It's been over 50 years since we've had the Occupational Safety and Health Administration Act, and it has saved a lot of lives and it's done a lot of great things for occupational safety and health. Um, however, when we, when we look at um, where losses actually uh, develop, uh, we look at that chain of occurrences that we're going to talk to, and I'm sure Jim's going to speak to here in a few seconds. We look at, at the statistical uh, analysis of how they occurred, what went wrong, what happened. We notice that nine, about 95% um, of those incidents involved some type of at-risk behavior. It really wasn't the condition. And um, so we want you to keep that in mind. You look at people's behavior, what they do, what they say, how they act. Um, you can be in trouble for basically two things, really. Uh, omission, what you fail to do, and commission, what you do or what your people do on your behalf. So think of it from, when you're looking at risk, really focus in on people's behaviors because that's generally involved in the root cause of the incident. Next slide, please. And here you see in this cartoon, kind of says it all, where we've stacked the chairs up inappropriately to post the workplace safety standards. Um, and as much as we preach, as much as we try to communicate, you're still gonna have individuals involved in at-risk behaviors. You as leaders in the adaptive sport world, you, you get involved in some pretty um, uh, significant activities that come with a, a, a substantial amount of risk. Uh, but you as professionals, understanding what you do, understanding your trade and having uh, great knowledge about your environment and the things that you do, uh, it's up to you to intervene to recognize, evaluate, and control those at-risk behaviors. Next slide. So when we see organizations that, that struggle, that have trouble with the communication aspects, the implementation, and the at-risk behaviors, this is typically what we see, this yo-yo effect, this roller coaster ride. And this, this graphic here does not represent anyone's uh, specific loss data. This is just a, a representation of a, a poor indicator where there are controls missing. And you get this yo-yo effect where some years, like in 2018 in this slide uh, projects, you had a pretty good year. You know, you have your ups and your downs. What we're trying to do is, is stabilize your risk profile uh, so that you're not caught with this up, up and downs, which ultimately leads to, again, significant emotional events where people get hurt, injured, maimed. We don't want that, but also leads to lost dollars that affect your organization. Everything you do as a chapter can ultimately come back to affect the, the greater good. Um, and, and obviously part of the mission is not to hurt people, certainly. Next slide. So let's, a new way of thinking of, of safety. Think, think of safety as not that necessary evil, that thing we have to do, we're forced to do. Um, safety is not a priority. Um, safety really is a value. It's in your DNA. It's in the fabric of what you do. Priorities change, but values do not. Think of it in that, those terms. So safety is embraced, adapt, adopted as part of the value of your chapter and the things that you do. Um, it's taken seriously uh, and it's managed properly. Uh, those values and that value system for your organization should not change. Next slide. So here's a, a friend of mine, safety colleague. He's out of South Carolina. If you've ever get to see him at one of your conferences, go see him. Bill Sims with Bill Sims Safety. And I put this slide in here because I was watching, I was watching Bill speak at one of these conferences years and years ago. I've been a safety professional for over 30 years. And what he said one day hit me right between the eyes like someone hit me with a two by four. He said, your safety management system is designed perfectly for the results you're achieving. And I thought about that and I said, like, wow, that's just a simple statement, but that really says a mouthful right there. It says it all. So if you're experiencing those that ups and downs, that yo-yo effect within your, your loss profile, uh, or you feel or you observe that there are many unsafe behaviors or maybe a lack of adherence to the to our procedures or SOPs that we're just really not where we need to be. Go back and take a look at your whole safety management system. 
uh, because it really is designed perfectly for the results you're achieving. Next slide. One of the things that Bill talks about in his presentation is the Deepwater Horizon event that occurred. It's 10 years now, I can't believe it's been 10 years, that led to the, the deaths of 11 individuals on that rig. Um, and and the, why, why I put this in here, I just want you to understand what happened on this particular day. Uh, this rig was controlled by British Petroleum, uh, Transocean and Halliburton, three agencies that were working on this, this rig in the Gulf. And uh, the morning of this explosion, um, the CEO of BP flew in, landed on the rig, and gave out a, a bunch of safety incentives, awards, prizes, recognized this rig for one of the safest rigs in the entire operation. And on that very day, the explosion occurred and 11 people died on that rig. And as we did an after action report, as they reviewed it, what went wrong, sure, they had safety policies, they had procedures, they were highly regulated in this industry. But what they had really was a perception of safety. Because as we did the as they did the investigation, they found over 100 items that were outstanding, recommendations that should have been considered, should have been taken care of, complaints from workers right from that very rig who identified that there were some controls. They were taking shortcuts, that they really weren't as safe as what, as what management thought they were. So did they have the perception of safety? Yes, but did they have the presence of safety? No. Next slide. One safety professional from way back in traditional safety times in the early 60s is Dr. Dan Peterson. And he says that the multiple calls factor is significant in uh, incidents and understanding how incidents develop. He said that behind every accident, there are many contributing factors, not just one thing that occurred. And many times uh, you, you do what we say, you practiced for the event. Someone took a shortcut and got away with it 50 times, 100 times. There was some type of unsafe behavior or act or condition that led up to that incident, not just one factor. They occur in random fashion to cause accidents. So when you're doing your incident investigations, and I'm not gonna step on Jim's toes, he's gonna to cover this, look at the multi-contributing uh, factors involved in an incident. Next slide. This is a traditional risk management model. How do we manage risk? And you see you identify the risk, you analyze it, plan of action, you implement, and then you measure, and then you try to control it, and then that's a cycle that continues. Uh, how do we manage risks? There are basically four ways we can do it. We can say, hey, we're going to accept this risk and hopefully implement some controls or mitigations. We're going to avoid it, i.e., we're not going to do that particular activity or event or task or action. We're going to transfer risk, which is what a, an insurance is. We're your insurance broker, but we help you in that aspect of transferring risk, the financial aspects of that, transferring risk to an insurance carrier, for example. We mitigate, we, we inter, intervene and we try to implement controls to lessen the probability and severity of the event. That's traditional risk management. Let's take a look at another model. Next slide. There is an actual ISO standard, uh, just like there are ISO standards for other things you may be familiar with for environmental quality control. There's an ISO standard for enterprise risk management. We don't expect you to dive into this standard. It's very extensive. Um, it can take several years to become certified, but we just want you to know that ISO 31000 is out there. And what it does is it manages risks, all risk of an organization, and helps them meet their goals and object objectives, regardless of the type of risk that they're taking. So let's talk a little bit about ERM. Next slide. Maybe you've seen this slide. Maybe you've never seen this graphic before. But this comes out of the Committee of the Sponsoring Organization. You don't need to know a long history on this. But basically what happened was, um, a, a committee was formed to look at the banking institutions across the country of how they control their risk. And uh, this really, like as I said, st stemmed from the financial services group. And they took this model and they ran this through to look at how financial institutions manage risk. But then someone on a very higher pay grade than I, much smarter than me, figured this out by looking at it and said, you know what? Our risk management folks are over here and they're doing something very similar to this. Let's plug this in and see how this works just for managing risk. And lo and behold, they found and identified that every organization, no matter how large, how small, private, government sector, non-GO, profit, non-for-profit, didn't matter. Across the top there, you see, each organization has objectives, either strategic, operational, reporting, or compliance objectives. They do it every day and everything they do. 
And on the, on the, uh, on the vertical axis there, you see the internal environment, objective setting, event identification. That's just basically simply saying, what do we do and how do we do it? Have we done some type of risk assessment? What's the response to that? What controls have we put in place? I know you folks have a lot of controls. We've looked at what you do. We've looked at your activities. We realize that you put controls in place. And the information and communication aspects that we, we talked about earlier are certainly an important aspect of that. And then you monitor, you know, how did that go? Did it go well? Should we change this? Should we adapt this uh, activity or uh, procedure? So you do all these things. And it doesn't matter there. You look at the right there of the slide, you see the business segment. It doesn't matter if, you know, each within your organization, whether it's at the very smallest local level, I don't care if it's five, 10 volunteers getting together for an activity. You're part of that segment of the organization, that cross-sectional view, there are subsidiaries, the business unit, you can call it chapters, divisions, whatever you want to call it. You're all part of this control and government aspect. And the COSO risk management model is a good way to look at the activities and the controls that you currently have implemented, not only within your chapter, but that as an organization is moving united. Next slide. Here's a simple hazard risk matrix. And this is not rocket science, and we teach clients to do this every day, but basically in a nutshell what this is, is a way of taking an individual activity or a, a, a risk or potential threat that you think your organization or chapter may have and, and plugging it into a hazard risk assessment. Uh, this is just one example. You can go on the internet and find hundreds of, hundreds of these, but what you're trying to do is quantify risk. You're trying to put a number value on it to identify is that risk inside or outside of our threshold? Is it inside or outside of our comfort level? So on the left-hand column there, you see what is the frequency of what we do? How probable is it somebody could get hurt or injured or there could be a significant emotional event? And then on the right or the uh, X axis going, axis going across, do you see that is really the hazard category or the severity level? It's a one, two, three, or four, you know, one being the most severe. And you plug in the particular, you have this conversation, you huddle up and you say, hey, we're doing this on a zip line. Let's talk about the inherent threats or risk imposed by going across a zip line. And you get some really smart people together and you start plugging this in, doesn't take all, all day, five to 10 minutes, and you come up with a hazard identification number to understand, am I in the red? Am I in the yellow? Am I shaded? Am I kind of in between? Or can we operate uh, and maybe still do this activity but put in some controls to lessen the probability of a loss or an occurrence and the severity of impact. That's all this is. Simple hazard risk assessment. Next slide, please. We want you to understand the hierarchy of controls. This upside down, down triangle has been used for years by safety professionals, but really what it means is, uh, and we're seeing this with COVID-19. This is a perfect example. You can plug it in there. What are we trying to do with the threat? We're trying to obviously eliminate it, right? That would be through a vaccine or substitute which would be antibodies that we're using right now. We're doing isolation. We're putting in engineering controls, which would be, uh, let's say those glass panels, those plexiglass panels to eliminate uh, contact. Uh, we've put in some administrative controls, right? People staying at home and we're using PPE, but look where we're using PPE folks. It's the last resort. And many times organizations wanna jump right into PPE as their first option. All we're saying here in this, in this slide when you look at risk and how you're gonna mitigate and control risk is to look at the hierarchy of controls. Go back to this, this upside down triangle and try this, this flow of action. Don't jump right into PPE. That should always be your last resort. Next slide. So we're almost finished here. PRDM is something that uh, we could spend a day on, but I thought I'd show it in, on this, in this presentation in case you wanna research it a little bit. Basically this prime recognition decision-making is ingrained in all of us. We're born with it. It works. This is how humans think. This is how we process information. The, the human brain's kind of like a computer hard drive. When we're presented with a situation, our brains scan what is, what is going on, what's happening here. And they, your brain looks for a match in the hard drive. Like I said here, I've been here before, I've done this, I've seen this movie, this is what happened last time. But many times organizations rely on our personnel, our people, to rely on PRDM in their decision-making process. And many times it can fail us because the conditions do change, particularly on low frequency, high severity operations. Remember that, low frequency, high severity operations. That's where we don't do something that often, once or twice a year, 
but the consequences could be significantly high if something goes wrong. High severity, potential for a significant emotional event, permanency, death, any of those conditions. I want you to stop and think about it. And this, this is why, because PRDM, next slide please, doesn't account for um, many of these aspects that we're gonna show. In this upper left-hand uh, quadrant, you see uh, those high risk of that low, low frequency, something we don't do that often, but very high severity. That's where I want the red flag to go up. I want you to start thinking, wow, we really need to take this and look at it closely. We need to go through a risk, risk uh, assessment, a risk matrix process, and see if we've done everything in our power to manage this risk. The only thing that changes on that slide up there is non-discretionary time and discretionary time. Non-discretionary time is usually if you're involved in an emergency operation, where there's little time to think. You're presented with a situation, you have to act. Fortunately, most of the activities that we're involved with, we have discretionary time. We have time to take a look at what we do, look at the, the, the threats and the potential exposures and manage and mitigate them. Next slide. Take advantage of that discretionary time. This is what PRDM doesn't account for. Personnel changes. You have people who have different knowledge levels, skills and abilities, physical conditions, mental states, competency and understanding, or we get overconfident. The process changes, people take shortcuts. There's various interpretations of, oh, I thought you wanted me to do this, so you wanted that. Habits, lack of control, failure to follow an SOP. The environment changes, the equipment could change that you're involved with, the rigging, uh, the brands of what you're using, they work in different fashions. Third parties, where we get other people involved who are helping us or assisting us with a particular activity. Those third party vendors can also uh, impact the risk significantly and understand rules of engagement. What are those regulations? What are those SOPs? What are those best practices we should be following and learn from others that are doing it right? Next slide, please. So in review, and we're turning over to Jim, recognize those standards that are out there. Understand the rules of engagement, particularly with your specific activities. That's why you're on this call. You're the folks that they are on the ground, boots on the ground, making it happen every day as part of the mission. Effectively communicate with other, others. Ensure those understanding of controls, what you expect, what those expectations are, and make sure the implementation is there. Make sure people, and don't be afraid to step up as a leader, not in a confrontational way, but in a value-added way, uh, as, as safety being a value within your organization, to step in and intervene when you see unsafe conditions or unsafe acts. Consider a simple risk assessment. We can teach you how to do it. It's simple, it's easy, it's quick, and it can, you can get a lot of mileage out of it. Follow those hierarchy of controls. Remember, PPE should always be your last resort. Go through those other controls first before you get to that, that step. Take time to analyze those high risk, low frequency activities. That's, where, that's what gets us in trouble in, in the severity world. Don't rely on PRDM that prime requisition decision-making, particularly if you have discretionary time. Look at what you're doing, break it down, use that discretionary time as your advantage. Consider changes in your operation that, can, that, that change impact of behaviors of, of loss exposures and conduct detailed accident investigations, which Jim Jordan, our area practice leader, is getting ready to take on right now. So Jim. Thanks, Charles. Ryan, can everybody see me on the video? Yeah, they should be able to. Sorry about that in advance then. Um, so uh, just to give you a little way, a way of background on mine, my, my name's Jim Jordan. Uh, I am, like Charles said, I'm the area practice leader of claims for um, United Move. Um, I am again, a national practice leader. So I'm responsible, responsible for all 50 states. Um, so any exposure that you may have within those states, I would be involved in or have some type of uh, conversation with your risk management team, Ryan, Cheryl, and the folks back at your corporate headquarters. Um, I've been working on the, all with you guys for about a year. And I have to say, I mean, I work pretty much in lockstep with Charles and, and I've been on presentations with him before and the safety folks always kind of get me nervous. Like, okay, are we doing everything we can to prevent th you know things from occurring out in the field? And, you know, being a claims person, you know, it's not always a glorious job because a lot of times you're dealing with bad situations, money being spent, those types of things. So what I want to do is just maybe talk at a high level. And uh, before I start with that, I just want to say, and I've commended and at Ryan and the team before this, the, the reports that you guys complete and send in and that we do share with your carrier partner 
are very detailed and provide a lot of information and valuable information, which is pertinent in regards to impacting you should something develop into a more serious situation. But from a claims perspective, you know, safety, I would view more as a uh, proactive approach, right? It's a value. Claims is in the same type of boat, but claims is more of a reactive process, right? When something occurs, a claim incident happens, we're reactive to that. We're, we're, we're trying to figure out what transpired, what can we do to mitigate that? The real goal of claims is to prevent future occurrences from occurring. What can we learn from that particular event? As Charles indicated, hazards, behaviors are really the prime essential function that cause a lot of incidents, specifically for you all, right? So, and I use the, the ski, and it seems to be that's been the prom, prominent uh, types of exposures that we see is that you have a lesson going on on the hill, and then you have the rogue runaway skier coming through the middle of your lesson, kind of knocking people down, and that's kind of where we're seeing some of your, for your incidents. Most of the claims that you're seeing are record only. Nothing really is occurring from a dollars and cents perspective. But I think when you're completing those investigations, you want to try to get as much detail as possible. And the most important thing you want to do when you're investigating claims is develop a, a good morale and rapport with any partners, volunteers, participants, because you want to try to get as much valuable information as you can from those individuals in order to assess and obtain as much information should and if something develops into a more serious situation, i.e. someone gets an attorney, you know, decides to litigate something. So uh, I'll give you a little bit of a story. I, I have a real quick story because I know we're limited on time, but I work with another nonprofit up towards the Philadelphia area. Again, they have national exposure. And the difference between them and you guys is that essentially when, it, when an incident occurs, the, the corporate culture is very, I want to say negative, but it's very, uh, it holds a, a negative connotation to people. So ver fo folks are very resistant to report claims or incidents to their to their care partners. So they had an incident where they were driving, uh, they call them a component, which would be your chapter. They're driving one of their participants to a doctor's appointment. The car gets in a motor vehicle accident. Well, this is the third accident that this particular driver had for the employee for the employer. So they were very hesitant about reporting the claim. So there was a assistant in the car. So what they did is they switched out. I wasn't driving. This person was driving. And when we come to find out that the person was supposedly driving the car was not licensed. So technically, so it created even more problems because first of all, they lied about the incident. And secondly, the person that they said was driving the vehicle wasn't even licensed. So it, it, it the, the culture that you create and making sure that you report as much factual information as you can is is crucial. But more importantly, the culture that you create with the folks that you that you have in the field is even more important. You folks have wear multiple hats day in and day out. You're the safety person. You're the claims person. You're dealing with volunteers. You're dealing with participants. You're dealing with employees. So you're dealing with a lot of different moving parts. And I think that how you how you organize that's essential, especially when something happens in the field. Next slide, Rye. Right there. Okay. So we want to investigate all, all incidents. The big thing we want to do is the who, what, where, when, and why. It's essentially you want to get as much information as you can. Who was involved? What, what time of day was it? What was the weather like? Why did it happen? Um, could it been could it have been prevented? Those are the types of questions that you want to have kind of in your holster so that when you're completing those investigations, you can kind of make sure you get all of those questions answered. I mean, it's pretty self-explanatory. Um, you guys, all like I said before, you do a great job of providing that information. But I think if you're going to continue to do that, you need to make it part of your daily routine going in every time that you're investigating a matter. Next slide, please. So prioritize. So you do not have a brick and mortar facility. You guys do not work in a manufacturing plant, right? So everything that you deal with is most likely in the field, conducting some type of event or some type of lesson, whatnot, with a participant and or volunteer. So you don't have, you know, a workspace. So having that information in a bag, something handy in a car is essential. You need to make it a common practice. Um, you have to have the mentality that, Oh, here we go. We had another incident occur. I had to fill out an incident report and go through the whole process. Um, you really need to take a deep breath, step back, evaluate it from an objective, objective perspective, obtain as much information as you can. You're not going to always get all that information up front, but try to get as much as you can. Handwritten notes is probably the key. 
Um, but probably the most important thing that you can have is your cell phone. You can record on it, you can take photographs with it, um, you can t type yourself notes down. So I've used this numerous times, even um, when I'm at meetings with clients where I'll actually type notes to myself in my notes function on my phone. So using your phone is a, is a, is a major tool to have when you're investigating claims. Next slide, please. A kit. Another thing that you could probably have since you don't have a lot of brick and mortar facilities, maybe you have these at hand and I'm sure you'll have most of this stuff on site, first aid equipment, those types of things. Tape measures, you know, if we need to measure something out, if something catastrophic happens, someone runs into a tree or something happens that we need to kind of make sure that we get some more detailed information, having those types of tools on hand at the immediate time of the incident are gonna pay dividends in the long run. Having graph paper and notes that you can actually draw a diagram on, even if it's a rough guesstimate at that point, those types of things are gonna be essential, in, especially in trying to mitigate any lost dollars. Because if you do have a claim that's gonna be impactful from a financial perspective, you wanna impact that positively, right? So you wanna control the post-loss cost containment. So as much information as you can compile and the most that you can have ready, should and if when something happens, the better off you're going to be. So these are just some some recommendations that you can kind of have. Um, keep them in a knapsack. I've had clients that they do that, just have that on site should they need it. Um, they do prove to be very essential should and if an incident does occur. Next slide, Rye. Again, it's self-explanatory. Beginning an investigation is crucial. Everything's fresh in everybody's mind. Everybody's going to remember things more clearly at the beginning of something as opposed to maybe a week or two down the road. Now, God forbid something catastrophic happens. You may not be able to get that information immediately, but you want to try to get that within a, t with a reasonable time period just so that you can have that information documented. Again, you want to probably put pen to paper on a lot of those things. If you have to take a statement for some times, you can take a recorded statement, but even getting a, a written statement from someone even provides more valuable information should and if and when a claim may have to be litigated. Um, having someone sign off on that statement that they have, um, you know, could be beneficial should, should something happen down the road. The big thing when you're investigating and completing these investigations, you want to be empathetic to the, to the individuals involved. You want to show sympathy. You want to show compassion. Um, you want to show that you understand what happened. Um, the other thing you want to keep in mind that if there was some type of equipment or some type of, so say they were on a lift, a ski lift, and they were coming down off the ski lift and the ski lift malfunctioned and caused an injury, that potentially could impact the claim because if a third party was responsible for that injury, we could potentially what they call subrogate against that manufacturer or if that defect with that particular piece of equipment. So having the name of that equipment, any serial number information, any type of maintenance records that we can get are essential to, to, to investigate and, and provide to any carrier partners when you're comp comp compiling your information. That's not things you want to try to get six months down the road because a lot of times people, things are going to get misplaced. People are going to not remember things and it's, it could be a little bit cumbersome um, trying to get that information after the fact, so to speak. Next slide, please. Fact finding. Again, this is stuff we, and I'm sure I'm probably showing my age here, but dragnet, just the facts, right? You, you, you don't want to get people's opinion. You don't want to provide your own opinion. You just want to get the facts of what transpired, who the injured party was, were there any witnesses, their names, phone numbers, email addresses. Um, if you can capture a pic, a pic, photos at the time of the incident, they're crucial if someone's laying there to kind of get a sense of. If you can't do it at that particular point in time, go back at a later time and try to recreate that situation so you have that. Again, like I said, service records, any type of operational logs that may have been responsible for impacting that claim, we want to try to compile that information at the onset as opposed to trying to getting that down the road. Um, any type of equipment, photos of that equipment um, are very crucial and impactful to the claim as well. Next slide, please. So techniques, taking notes, the overall weather are really pretty, pretty, pretty convenient. Pictures, the more you can take, the better, the better off you're going to be. If you're trying to gauge if with taking a picture of something, using a ruler, a coin, or something to kind of show the contrast and the depth of that particular area can show angles. And what you want to do is you want to start far back and then work your way up towards the scene. 
So if, for, 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 so if someone fell and say they were in a motor vehicle accident at an intersection, you want to kind of step back and take it back as far as you can and then kind of work your way up to the impact point. Same type of thing if something happens with a slip and fall accident or something along those lines, you want to kind of take it from the way back and work your way forward. Um, if there is a piece of equipment that malfunctioned, if a ski broke or a, some type of snowmobile was involved, you want to retain that piece of equipment and not discard it. Because if there's an attorney involved at some point down the road, they may want to come and examine that particular piece, have an engineer, some type of expert come out. And if we either repair it or put it back into service without someone else inspecting it, then that could impact the overall cost of any claims that we get um, from, a, from a carrier partner's perspective. Next slide, please. So interviewing witnesses, um, this is probably going to be a little bit of a challenge for you all, right? Because I said you're not like at a brick and mortar facilities. You don't have an office that you can maybe have these types of conversations with. Um, if there are witnesses that you need to talk about or talk with, you could maybe schedule it for the next day to kind of meet in person at a, at a, at a Starbucks or something more convenient that's going to be kind of a more of an intimate setting that you can get that information. I found that sometimes people aren't always want to be forthcoming with there's a group of people around but if you can get them in in a one-on-one -on -one type of setting that you'll probably get a little bit more information from them especially if we're trying to get to something that may be a little bit more of a questionable type of event and we're trying to get to, to the facts that just things don't seem to be adding up those are the types of th things that you maybe want to tr create a separate meeting and have a one-on-one -on -one conversation you always want to ask questions where the person's going to elaborate and talk um, you want to avoid yes no questions um, you don't want to assert blame to anyone. Again, you want to kind of be collaborative with that individual. You want to make sure that you're having a, you know, a good conversation back and forth. As soon as things start to get adversarial at that point, I would probably just take a deep breath, step back and then make a determination at that point in time. You know, should we continue that conversation now or maybe we come back, you know, in an hour or two and come back and talk to that individual at that point in time. Um, you may forget to ask a question when you're interviewing someone. It happens all the time. You can always reach out the next day if something thinks, of, hey, I was just thinking the other day, I forgot to ask you, could you just let me know, you know, what, what time of day was it? I mean, were there other people there? I thought they said that John Doe was there, but uh, can you confirm that or deny that and let me know? You can ask those questions. Don't, don't, be, don't feel funny about going back a day or two later if you forgot to ask something that you think will be critical to that particular event. Next slide, please. So writing the report, and like I said, this is where you want the when, where, who, how, and why captured. And I can tell you on the reports that I've seen that you all submit or the folks that have submitted um, incident reports, they are very detailed and thorough. There are individual names on there. Those types of, of, of events are being captured. The one recommendation I would probably make is if, if you can capture more photographic evidence and, and something that you may have a better sense on could develop into something a little bit more, could be impactful. You don't necessarily have to submit it with the claim at that point in time. I mean, it would be beneficial if you could, but just something to think about, um, you know, that you can always, I'd rather have more is less, right? So the more you can give, the better off you're gonna be. Try to get as much information as possible. I mean, again, you don't want a three-page report on something that you know is not going to be a big deal, but I think you're going to have that gut feeling on those incidents that you think, eh, something's going to happen with this. And those are the ones that you want to make sure you have all the I's dotted and the T's crossed because the more information you can give to your carrier partners, the better off you're going to be, shouldn't, as Charles indicated, if we have to get the carrier involved and, and maybe kind of have a little bit more direct conversations with them on how things are being adjudicated with a particular claimant or individual. Next slide, please. So that's pretty much it. And like I said, I, I work with probably three or four other nonprofits. And I'm not trying to be, you know, you guys are probably in the top two that I deal with from, from a detail oriented perspective. Um, there's very collaborative can follow up with participants, volunteers. I see that on incidents that we're getting. Um, Ryan and Cheryl and her team do share those conversations with us. So you are checking up with those individuals. Hey, how are you making out? Is everything going OK? Is there anything that I can do? to help you out. You guys do a tremendous job of that. And I think that's a challenge so specifically for maybe some of your larger chapters that may not have the time to do that. That extra olive branch and that extra touch point goes a long way with, in, with people. They, they, they appreciate it more than you really realize. And, it, and I hate to say it it, it, it impacts at such a point that most folks may not pursue something in a litigation perspective 
if you do show that you care and are empathetic to what's going on and how and how they're being treated. Um, if you treat people well, they're going to treat you well back. That's been my experience with that. So um, with that, I know we're a little bit over, but I thank you. I know I went through that very, very quickly. Um, I know my, my, my contact information is going to be here, but feel free to reach out to me anytime. I know Ryan and Cheryl and the team back at uh, Bethesda always are able to reach out um, should you guys need anything. Yeah, awesome. Um, thank you, James, Jim, and Charles for joining us. Um, I know we said this was going to be about 45 minutes, but for those of you who want to stay on, uh, we're more than happy to answer any questions you may have. Um, for Jim, James, or Charles, based upon this presentation or other um, risk management and mitigation related questions you have um, for the next couple of minutes, uh, feel free to drop those in the questions box. Um, I'll also do a quick plug for the survey. Uh, check the chat feature. Um, Kayla will be dropping in the survey link in there um, to give back your feedback for this session. Um, but I want to, again, kind of echo what, more specifically, what Jim was saying in regards to incident reporting and the documentation. Uh, for those on the Move United Insurance Policy, um, you have all done a phenomenal job over the years on documenting um, every type of incident. Uh, you know, anything from little Johnny slipped, fell, or little Johnny, you know, threw a temper tantrum and threw a, a rock at, you know, Counselor A at the camp last year. Um, but, you know, documenting the smaller incidences that are of record only that no dollars and cents, as Jim put it, would come from help us understand a, a pattern of behavior as well as see a trend that may be occurring within your organization or your, your sport or activity that we'll be able to address on a larger scale uh, nationwide potentially. So thank you and keep that coming. Um, and then as, hey, Ryan, as people don't feel comfortable asking questions, feel they can email you after the fact because I know some folks don't like to ask questions. They, yes. they want to email and then you guys can reach out to us after. I'm more than willing to. And I know Charles would be as well. So absolutely. And then one um, question I wanted to, or piece I wanted to throw out there is um, in the same vein, every organization's um, high severity, what is deemed as high severity, um, is a little different. You know, everyone's ten is their ten. Um, that's fine. You know, we'll we'll do our best to handle it accordingly. Uh, but just know that you know, uh, while a blown meniscus on a volunteer may seem like the end of the world to that volunteer and that smaller organization in the grand scheme of things, and it claims an incident reporting. Um, it may potentially not be, um, but still report as if it is high severity, be as detailed and documented as possible, because uh, that'll, again, to Jim's point, provide more uh, information in the event that something needs to come from it. Um, one thing, we did have a couple questions come through um, regarding being able to access this. A reminder, this will be captured and um, posted on the uh, Leadership Conference uh, webpage. And then, does the incident report form capture critical content in reporting, or should we look for extra documents or resources on this front? Um, I'll answer, and then I guess, Jim, if you want to kind of echo, maybe fill in yeah, the blanks yeah, here. Sure. Uh, we've done sure. our best to provide a comprehensive incident report form that isn't overly burdensome, but does enough to capture the details. So we feel um, it's pretty robust in that it capture, captures the critical content. But uh, I'd love to hear your response to that. Yeah, so I view that incident report as a living document, right? So there's oh, there's going to be something six months down the road that we're going to be that we may see that we need to incorporate into that to that form. Um, I would if recommend if the, somebody in the, in, the, in the field feels that that we should be capturing additional information in regards to more detailed information on witnesses, then I think we should consider doing that. Um, there's there's no right answer with that, and like I said, your the forms created to try to be as easy as possible to complete and submit. Um, but again, if there's recommendations, and I don't want to speak for Ryan and, and the team, but I think if there's some something that we could do that's better, more efficient, then, I, that, then I'm all for it. And you know, like I said, we've we've already tweaked it a couple times, you know, minor tweaks to it um, since I've been working with Ryan. So, I mean, I think it needs to be a collaborative effort. Like I said, the folks in the field that are in the, with the chapters, you are wearing multiple hats. You're the ones, the, the face of that individual. So if there's things that we could be doing better, then we're all for listening to those ideas. Great. James, you're not talking, hey, but I Charles. think you're on mute. So. I got it. Yeah, I'm off mute now, I think. Hey, Charles, Sorry. Um, you, you were speaking to, uh, you're speaking to near misses, Charles. Can you elaborate on that and how that could be used as education in the field? 
Uh, sure. Yeah, one of the things that we we uh, we didn't mention were near miss information or data that we can obtain. Um, high performing organizations try to obtain this information, um, but for many reasons, they find themselves unable to to uh, tap into uh, the that resource. The one thing that we want to try to do is if you do experience a near miss incident. Uh, we don't want that to be punitive in nature, obviously, if you report. Um, some may think, oh my, if I tell them we did this or we did that, um, they're going to they're gonna, uh, they're gonna fault me for that or penalize me for that. And um, sorry, I had another call coming in. Uh, but that data is, is so important because, as I said in my presentation, many times we're practicing for that loss. Uh, and it might be a near miss where there's no property damage, no personal injury. But if we communicate that to others and other chapters who are conducting similar operations and learn from that information, oh, that's so valuable uh, that we can obviously prevent uh, an occurrence from ever from ever uh, happening. So that that's why that's so valuable and learn from it. And then have we have the opportunity again? We have discretionary time then to look at the incident, share it with everyone and come up with solutions. And I would almost think you guys do that now, right? I mean, for the most part, I would think, you know, some of the claims that are incidents that are being reported are, I would even constitute as near misses. Like there's really nothing that's come about of them, but you know, something could have, um, you know, not all, but some, there's a few that I would, that I would, you know, quote as a near miss. Yeah. And that's a, a great point to bring up uh, Charles and Jim. And um, to one of the questions we have currently, we don't have a mechanism in which we share those um, analytically with our chapter network. Um, we have, are always striving to find mechanisms to do so, um, but we are constantly looking at the, that and trying to implement policy and um, recommendations and best practices based upon what we see. Um, but hopefully in the future, that's something that we'll be able to share um, with throughout. Um, and to Jim's point, um, someone asked about near misses within their own organization. And, you know, in the grand scheme of things, having someone fall on a ski lesson and hurt their arm or collide on a ski lesson and not get injured, but you document that, essentially is a near miss in the grand scheme of how significant that type of occurrence could be. Um, so it's like, okay, that went wrong, but nothing really bad came out of it. There, there's multiple of it. What, what goes on from there? Um, and I've had this conversation um, before where a near miss uh, essentially is a failure that just ended up being safely done with no no consequences, um, which is always nice to kind of hear and see. So thanks for resharing that, Chris. Um, there are a couple topical questions as it relates to um, the current state of affairs and being virtual. Um, from a risk, um, or maybe not so much a risk standpoint, um, but how do you recommend documenting incidences uh, that occur on a virtual platform when training, uh, whether it be hacking or uh, someone where it could be injured during a virtual training session? Um, are there examples out there that you had from other clients or advice that you might be able to give? Charles, you want me to take that or you want to take it? No, no go ahead. Now I'll give it a shot then. There's a collect thoughts here. So I, I would, I, my, my recommendation, so this is the world we're living in right now, right? Everything's virtual, everything's online. Um, I've educated my clients to essentially treat it like you're working, you know, in the office that you would work. So I'm working from home. I'm usually technically in an office setting. If something happens here that, you know, now granted, if I'm out walking my dogs and I get hurt, that's really not quote a worker's comp claim. However, if I get up from my desk and I trip off my chair, then I think that could be potentially considered a workers' comp claim. So you almost want to treat like the virtual environment that you would, you know, if you were in the field, so to speak. And I know it's really not a clear apples to apples comparison, but I think given the nature of what we're in and the laws and how things are going to be handled are going to be evolving over the next months. Um, you've seen property claims where everything's been denied up front for business interruption. I don't know if you've seen the news, I'm sure you have, but some carriers over the UK now are considering potential coverage for that, even though it may not be uh, a provision within the policy. So 
things are, are going to change. Uh, almost, I don't want to equate them to like a 9-11 situation, but you know, benefits may be offered to individuals that it may not be a clear cut, you know, opportunity given where we are right now, but that could all change two months down the road. So again, capturing that information like we would any other way is pertinent in my opinion. And that's kind of the education I've given my customers, other clients. In regards to the uh, virtual platform we just spoke about, this is a conversation that uh, Shell and Ryan actually, we spoke about a little bit ago when, when COVID really started uh, uh, moving on and, and closures were beginning. Uh, you know, we support the virtual uh, platform. There will be training done. Uh, some gyms uh, and other personal training facilities are, are doing the same thing. Physios are doing it as well. So we support this. And if there is a loss through a training uh, module, what, whatever is being put on, a document, 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 getting back to Jim and Charles's point, documentation is the biggest. And if it's recorded, obviously fantastic. If it's not, we ask that uh, whoever is leading it really uh, get it notified quickly. And, and whatever notes can be taken are, are quite important because we do lose, as you can see virtually, I mean, look at the scope behind Jim and I and Ryan, it's quite narrow in nature. So whatever verbally we can get uh, as quickly as possible. If screenshots are available, fantastic. That's another tool if, if available. Um, but but uh, on the virtual platform, it's supported uh, and known that, DIA, uh, that uh, Move United uh, is working through a virtual platform. Great. Brian, yeah. Anything else in the room? Um, I th there's a couple. Um, do we want to? We, we're running up on time here, um, so there's a couple larger uh, conversations that we're happy to follow up offline um, with you directly on, um, just regards to how much time we have remaining here. But thank you um, to Charles, James, Jim for uh, joining us this afternoon. Thank you for everyone in attendance. Um, for your questions. If anything, if you have further questions, please feel free to contact me, contact uh, Jim or Charles, our information was shared. Um, you'll all be receiving, again, a copy of this presentation in follow-up, um, and it can also be found on our website. Um, so thank you for taking the time to be cognizant of your program's uh, risk mitigation structures and practices, and um, hopefully this sparked an interest in a topic that you may not have been interested in, and we can continue the dialogue a little bit.